So my name's Sam Cooper. Uh, I'm a new lecturer in the Dyson School of Design Engineering. In fact, we're all new lecturers in the Dyson School of Design Engineering because it is new. Uh, I particularly focus on energy storage technologies. Uh, and the key theme of my work over the past few years has been about uncertainty in this field. And it's actually, of course, a theme that spans many topics indeed. So uh, I'm an energy scientist. I'm a materials designer. I also lecture the undergraduates mathematics. And I also am the admissions tutor for the department. So I decide, well, I'm part of the team that decides who gets to come and work with us next year. And as you'll see later on, I'm a huge enthusiast for online learning. Uh, I'm part of a bigger family than the department, so I'm in an interdepartmental collaborative group who work on electrochemical energy storage devices, all the way from molecular modeling, all the way up to techno-economic studies of countries and everything in between, but especially everything in between. We really focus on devices and their components and understanding how they relate to each other. So I'm going to talk to you about three particular case studies today, uh, work that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, one to do with second life cells, so cells that have already been used, software for science as opposed to code for science, and electrodes by design. How do we bring some of the principles of design into the space of electrochemistry? So we work with a company through Innovate UK funding called MCOPPER Solar, and they provide low-cost, low-power energy storage devices using a microfinance platform to people in East Africa. Uh, and they were wondering, can we take batteries out of a car when the car is deemed to be dead because it can't drive far or fast enough, but the cells aren't all dead? Can we take those cells and give them a second life in a new low-power application, creating very low-cost devices? One of the difficulties with that is working out which cell's good and which cell isn't. And we have quite a uh, state-of-the-art technique called differential thermovoltammetry, DTV to its friends, uh, that allows us to work out exactly how the cell is doing in terms of its health. Uh, so we've been analysing lots of cells, taking in hundreds of cells that have been used and understanding how their spectra explain their current state of health. We then use that data to take, imagine each dot on here is an old cell, and form unusual groupings, unusual clusterings. It's not always your nearest neighbours that are most similar. So compared to the industrial standard of just using two numbers, we now have thousands of numbers to describe the health of a cell with only a, a relatively straightforward additional test. This has been about translating the science that we've been doing for years at Imperial into an industrially useful piece of technology. The next concept is about software for science. There's a huge amount of coding going on at Imperial today that will result in no one ever using it for anything. It'll be done during someone's PhD. They'll be very proud of it, as will their mother. And it'll never be seen again once they've finished. And that's a shame. It's a waste. So uh, I put in that extra step, which is converting your code, which probably only you can read, into a piece of software, something that is intended, designed for other people to interact with, typically through some kind of graphical interface. And actually, my colleague Lorenzo, who'll be speaking to you later, has gone even further down the road with the same concept. So, Here's the problem. Electrochemical energy storage devices, like fuel cells, are very complicated. You look closer and the solid is full of holes, and you look closer and the solid is still full of holes again. And you look closer still and the bit that you thought was solid is also full of holes. Which holes matter? Which length scale is important? We don't know, actually. We're still working on it. So we need robust characterization techniques that help us answer these questions. In fact, the closer you look, the worse it gets. This is a lady looking at her cup of Thames water through a magnifying glass and finding that it is actually monster soup. So how do you go from some raw data to something that describes reality in some way? How do you go from grey to black and white? <laughs> the process that we've been developing at Imperial, as well as in other places, involves machine learning approaches because we like to stay in fashion. Uh, and uh, we found it extremely powerful compared to the contemporary hard-coded approaches where you say what should happen. Uh, and that's been an extremely uh, significant boost in the work that we've been pursuing. So much so that uh, I got carried away uh, and wanted to teach other people, spread the good news, uh, how to design and implement these techniques themselves. So I made an online course to teach others. The next step is turning some description of reality into some kind of useful model of performance. Yes, we know what it looks like. Now do we know how it works? Okay? And for that, I built my own piece of software. Initially, I built code. I gave it to my experimentalist friends, and they said, thank you, what is this? 
So I had to redesign it and make sure it could be used by anyone. Classic application, you double click, it installs, and then you can use it on your own data. So now you can import data straight from your experimental methods without detailed knowledge of the code behind it and see something about the material that you're trying to understand. That has led to collaborations. As soon as you make the skills that you have available to other people, suddenly everyone wants to be your friend. So we now have data that is deliberately delivered in the way that an experimentalist would expect to see it when it comes off their experimental rig. So designing that extra step to make sure that what you've done translates to what people are actually measuring in the world. I'm not an experimentalist, I would get lost in a lab. But to make that effort to have the conversation totally changes the impact of your work. The last topic, electrodes by design. So spurred on by these collaborations, we now have the opportunity to say, okay, we've seen what reality is like, but how should it be if we could choose? So we developed models which allowed us to perform optimizations on microstructure and start exploring possible configurations under the constraints of manufacture. And this led to a collaboration in this case with uh, Oxford, uh, who built a range of different battery systems and they had staggeringly different performance depending on subtle differences in the arrangement of their materials. This then led us at Imperial to say, well, we can do the same. So even in the Dyson School of Design Engineering, although we've just been getting set up, actually we have a lab at the moment that's able to produce electrospun nanofibers, fully flexible batteries, as well as aligned ionogel materials. These are state-of-the-art technologies that allow for a total difference in the way that you transmit your materials through your cell. They are flexible. They don't contain many of the rare, uh, well not rare, the transition metals that we so struggle to manufacture the supply chain for, for conventional cells. So this has been a sort of a journey where we've started with collaborations spurred on by modeling and ended up with our own capabilities to develop new technologies. So these three areas, I think, have led to some conclusions for me that actually for second life cells, it's about asking difficult and often quite ill-posed questions. What do you do with these second life cells? Understanding the sustainability issues around using something again, but if it doesn't last for very long, all you've done is just defer the waste problem. For software, for science, just be useful in general, if you can. And electrodes by design is to collaborate. If you have the opportunity, work with other people, it's a huge amplifier of your own potential and it's a lot of fun. So these are the people that I work with. As I say, the electrochemical science and engineering family is, is a big family and this is probably about half of our group because we've doubled in the last year thanks to the government's Faraday Challenge funding. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>